time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Professor Richard Freeman. Professor Richard Freeman holds the Herbert Oshman Chair in Economics at Harvard University. He is currently serving as Faculty Director of the Labor and Work Life Program at the Harvard Law School. He is also Director of the Labor Studies Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Senior Research Fellow in Labor Markets at the London School of Economics Center for Economic Performance, and Visiting Professor at the London School of Economics. He has published over 300 articles dealing with a wide range of research interests, including the growth and decline of unions, the effects of immigration and trade on inequality, restructuring European welfare states, Chinese labor markets, transitional economies, self-organizing non-unions in the labor market, and income dis distribution and equity in the marketplace. He has written or edited over 35 books, including America Works, The Exceptional Labor Market, Emerging Labor Market Institutions for the 21st Century, Can Labor Standards Improve Under Globalization, co-written with Kimberly Ann Elliott, Youth Unemployment and Joblessness in Advanced Countries, and uh, The New Inequality, Creating Solutions for Poor America. And he gave the plenary talk on labor standards and globalization are complements yesterday at the first day of the Challenges to Fair Trade conference that is taking place at the University of Washington today as well. If uh, you would begin, start out and give us the uh, the gist of, uh, I, I realize you had over an hour to, to give this talk yesterday, but if you could give us the gist on your ideas about labor standards and globalization are complements. Okay, well, there are two views that are widespread. Uh, cons some conservatives and neoclassical economists believe that if you put in labor standards, that's harmful to the economic development of poor countries, and there's a sort of a secret form of protectionism, as if we were putting tariffs on. And some people on the left believe that globalization endangers labor standards, and we're going to go down a, a, a low road uh, of continually dropping standards. And my thesis is that they're both completely wrong, that in fact globalization helps raise labor standards because it links us to the workers in the poorer countries around the world. When we buy the products, we want to make sure that the workers are being uh, decently treated. No one wants to buy products made by children in a slave labor camp uh, someplace in India. And in fact, part of your talk yesterday, I believe you said that actually currently labor standards are going up faster than any other time in history? Yes, th 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 that's right. Countries, first of all, have signed up for conventions, uh, international labor organization conventions about labor standards at the fastest rate we've, we've ever had. So nominally, they're, 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 they're joining standards. Countries are passing laws favorable to labor standards, uh, China being the most recent country to pass a new law. And there still is a big question of enforcement. But everybody is kind of realizing that if you play in the global world, you have to have decent uh, standards, or at least a commitment to decent standards for, for workers. So they're signing up to these standards, but uh, at this point, are there mechanisms in place for actually seeing what the results are? Very little, I would say. On, and, and that's, that's going to be a difficult thing that people are going to have to work on for a long period of time. We know that if it's a big U.S. corporation, like Nike, for instance, that has now basically committed itself to a corporate code of conduct on standards, it's very hard for them to monitor the factories overseas. And then if the factories are subcontracting to other factories, and some people may be subcontracting to people living in, in, in villages to do, to do some of the work, that's a very difficult uh, process. So I think that's going to be a, a long and... It's going to take a while before the standards rise sharply. In some cases, we have evidence that the standards have gone up. When countries, in, particularly in Latin America, pass a minimum wage, we now have studies that show the minimum wage really takes effect, and it passes over to the workers in the informal sector who aren't even covered by the minimum wage, apparently because it sets a social norm in, this, in that society that everybody should be paid whatever the agreed upon minimum is. Well, that's interesting because you regularly here in this country, I know just like, for instance, in Washington State, I believe the minimum wage went up another notch um, this, this last year, uh, 2007. 
and uh, you regularly read in like letters to the editor, you hear from the business community, from small businesses especially, that that's just that's going to hurt us. You know, we just can't survive these um, increases in minimum wage. But you say there's evidence to the contrary for that. Yeah, well, the minimum minimum wage is interesting as long as the increases or levels of the minimum are set quote reasonably. It may cut into a little bit of profits. It may cost – you may have to pay an extra few pennies for whatever the product the, the, the worker is, is making or the service the worker is giving. But there's no evidence that there's any great uh, economic de- deterrent. Um, obviously, there is a level of the minimum that would indeed harm the small businesses massively. And we all could imagine you tripled the minimum in the state of Washington tomorrow. There would be a lot of small businesses – Workers in big businesses who would lose their their jobs. Um, so so the the question is how careful we are in raising the minimum, and the fights are always over fifty cents or something like this. Um, I think in the case of the Washington state minimum, some of it began spilling over to Idaho, because in fact it had the opposite effect. People on the Idaho border wanted to now come to the state of Washington to work, so you actually increased your labor supply. And that's one of the things you have to think about. Uh, there may be people who are say, I'm not not interested in working, but you raise the minimum a bit, and they say, oh, well, it's worthwhile for me to work. And that actually helps businesses. Jumping back in terms to big businesses like uh, the Nikes and operations that are happening overseas, and they're keeping an eye on standards there, do you see much evidence of the companies themselves actually uh, proactively checking on what's going on in these countries, or is it tends to be efforts from from outside agitators, activists, um, saying that things are bad in these countries? No, look, look, companies have have organizations uh, uh, that, in fact, try to do monitoring, and they will do some monitoring on their own. So they're they're making some effort, uh, and then there's the outside agitators who are also making some effort, and I think they're also they they sort of complement each other. Companies, obviously, much easier for them to monitor their own factories and even to monitor those of their suppliers because the supplier can't say, go away, I'm not going to let you see my conditions uh, because, after all, the contract is there. But, of course, often they will tell the person when they're coming um, and they also may not have quite as a uh, committed monitors, as would the outside organization, but even the 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 take the worker rights consortium, which is the originally the the student organized group or the students, they 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 don't have monitors who can run around the world. What they live on is workers calling up. Somebody has to make a complaint to them. So I think you need the both both groups, and you recognize they will give you somewhat different pressures for raising standards, uh, but the, the two should work together. So do you see that as an example of one of the facets of the term globalization that is uh, in improving things for workers worldwide? Yes, because it, 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 it establishes, first, all, all workers worldwide know what better standards are because they, have, they know what things are like in the advanced countries and in, the, in the, 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 the countries that are doing better. And then... Second of all, the we pressure those the, our own companies, retailers, and and the brand names to make sure that things are done with good standards, and that spills over as well. And as long as we, as consumers, are willing to pay a few cents more, dollar more, depending on the the, the product, uh, to be guaranteed that it's made with standards, and somebody, you know, really really make sure the company that says it's making them with better standards is is trying to do that in a, in a serious way, Th- that just clearly has to improve the situation of the workers in the poorer countries. So is that a relatively new movement for uh, the, the idea of consumers want, I don't know if, even know if it's correct to say consumers want this. Um, it seems to be, again, outside forces that started, let's say, the fair trade movement. No, that's right. That's the agitators. or I, I like to think of them as the equivalent of uh, business entrepreneurs. And they're entrepreneuring a, a different product. In this case, the product is good labor standards. And just like an entrepreneur, they have to find out what the consumers are willing to pay, what they're going to get concerned about. Consumers, for instance, are more upset about child labor than they will be about uh, 
let's say, anti-union activity by a company. Uh, some consumers will be obviously very concerned about anti-union activity, but others, well, it's not their business. They'll say it's a fight between capital and labor, and that's 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 something different. But child labor, uh, slavery, you know, forced labor, um, those things, you can make you can you can make a lot of trouble for a company, and the companies, of course, know that. And when they when the gap when they found the one of the gap subcontractors. It was it was having a plant in India or a, a workplace in India where the children basically were were slaves. I mean, it was pretty awful forced labor. Instantly responded, and why did they respond instantly when it was found out? It was because obviously the Gap realized their their customers did not want uh, this to be associated with the products they bought, and so the Gap acted immediately. My guess is that if it wasn't for globalization, if it wasn't for the a- a- activists informing people about this, informing the Gap about this. They didn't plan, they didn't tell one of their subcontractors, oh, l- let some of the work go to a horrible you know, place where, where children are kept in forced labor. So the information came out and they acted instantly. And that's one of the, I think, benefits of the whole global pressure put on people. And are you seeing uh, examples of this happening elsewhere? Like, for instance, uh, Walmart, that seems to get a lot of its products made overseas. They don't seem, and maybe I'm wrong, but they don't seem as receptive to uh, incidents like what would move the gap quickly. Well, there's the, 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 some belief uh, that Walmart, since it's selling products usually to lower income folks, that they don't have the extra money, let's say, to pay an extra dollar for the product to be guaranteed. But in fact, presently, Walmart is, I think, rethinking their position in this area. And w- w- Walmart's does realize that uh, they have a, a bad image in lots of parts of the country, even though they, the products are you know, nicely priced. And I, th- I think within the next year, we may see Walmart uh, take a, a, a more of a lead in this area of, of, of moving. That what they probably don't want is unions in their U.S. workplaces. They've accepted unions in their Chinese workplaces, but that's because the Chinese government put pressure on them rather than consumers from, from the West. And uh, I think we'll see them become more m- more progressive uh, as time goes on when they when they realize that uh, even their customers do do not want uh, certain kinds of uh, you know products made in really bad conditions. And it also gives them some sort of a greater credence in the in the political community. They have other troubles. It becomes better to be known as I do. I'm doing some good things. Mm. Uh, if, if if you're doing nothing good, the, the, the the politicians are unlikely to feel that that nicely about uh, about you. As well, I believe you raised the point yesterday in your talk that you'd like to see organizations like Starbucks, they have yet to come forward with information about that the extra they charge for, let's say, fair trade products, that there's evidence that that money is actually going to the workers. Yeah, it would be very nice if, if when people have a fair trade label, they provide a lot of information about exactly what they are doing, and and if they're charging, you know, fifty cents or a dollar more, say for for the for the coffee, to have a how much of that dollar is actually going to workers, how much of it is perhaps going to build schools in the in the areas where the where the you know, the coffee is is, is being uh, produced, and uh, we've not seen that from 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 companies yet. Um, and that is one of the difficulties with labels. I put, I put a fair, made under good conditions label on something, and you can't be sure that it really is made under good conditions. Uh, well, because the company can't be sure either. There's always somebody who will cheat. But you want to know at least that the extra money you're paying or the money that the company is giving, you know, their own you know, profits that they're giving up to, to, have the, to make a good product, that label really stands for for something. I mean, you'd like the same way we do in charities. Charities should got to tell you how much money gets to the people the charity is trying to help, and how much is going to administrative overhead. And if you see a charity where ninety eight cents of the dollar you give goes to the the uh, pay of the head of the charity, you know that's not a charity you want to give to. And the same kind of standards should be uh, applied to. To these labels and these claims, it's fair trade coffee. Okay, what exactly are you doing? 
So what do you see as solutions to um, solving the, the label dilemma? Do you think organizations need to be created that one can trust and depend on to do oversight over these? Yes. I mean, there, there are organizations that do some of the things already, um, and some of them are fairly close to the business community, but they're not dishonest organizations because obviously you get, you know, if you're really doing sham things, you're going to get into trouble. So part of it is to pressure those organizations to keep raising their standards, to say when a business gets a particular label from one of these organizations that, in fact, the business has to give some accounting. Uh, transparency and, you know, and, and, and honest accounting of what's going on uh, will go a long way to establishing the labels as a good, uh, something you can trust. It also gives the, would give the label the protection because just in this gap situation, there's always going to be some producer someplace in the world who who've, who's, will be cheating and will be doing not what the code of conduct that the company has or whatever it is. And you want to be able to say, oh, th that's not normal in my company. I act quickly. Uh, our label is good. You've seen our things. And yeah, we're going to have problems. We'll all, there'll always be problems. There's always criminals and there's always crooked stuff and so on. But w w you can trust us in general. And that's what I think you, you, we need from the from the labels is that a, a, a surety. You also presented an interesting idea yesterday, the idea of bounty hunters uh, and checking on these factories. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the, the, the notion was, okay, who, who is going to go out searching for the factories or the workplaces where the standards are really grievously, you know, betrayed, people are poorly treated? And, okay, you can have some activists who will do that. And there may be some people in local communities who will do that. But a very, quote, American West kind of style would be, to say, okay, for every violation you can come up with, we, we you know, prove good violation, you'll get $5,000 as a bounty. And then we would have a bunch of, of private people who would go around uh, these various factories. They would find some way to find out what's going on. Now, the danger with this kind of, of, of plan would obviously be, I, uh, I go to you as a worker at the radio station, I say, declare bad conditions, and I'll split the 5,000 with you. <laughs> um, so uh, the a bounty hunter scheme has got to be, would have to be done very well. But it's, the idea is to put a, little, a, a, a certain amount of money up so private individuals w would, in fact, form little businesses. That would be our job is to find the factories that are the worst ones. If I was a, a, heading a, one of these large companies, I might—, might Try that out. Um, you know, say, okay, inside our company, we know there are going to be some factories that are really bad. Uh, I will pay any group or organization that turns up the really bad factories. And they have to be proven that the factories you know, really are bad. It can't just be you run around and say, that factory's bad. Give me my $5,000. Um, and uh, you know, it's using the market and using profit to, uh, to, to help do something good. Have you seen any effort on the industry's side dealing with the fair trade labels that have come out in response to that to try and, let's say, um, dilute the, uh, the concept of fair trade? For instance, in the organic labeling, uh, there was an effort and there continues to be to dilute that so that, you know, organic where it used to be um, a range fed animal would actually be, you know, out in a range. And they were trying to say, well, no, if, if the cows actually can see the outside from our building, that qualifies as being, you know, a range fed animal. Have you seen anything similar to that in fair trade? Well, there are, I mean, there are a bunch of labels in, uh, around and there are indeed weak labels and stronger labels. Oh, so, so I would say, yes, you have the same kind of, 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 of a phenomenon. And um, it, it's not that people disagree with what the standards are, though, in the sense of the organic example you just gave, with the cows. But it's uh, how often should you monitor? Uh, do you make uh, surprise visits to, to some of your suppliers? Or do you tell them beforehand how well trained are your monitors? Uh, if your monitor is a a retired uh, accountant, um, and uh, you know, and he's I don't know, he or she is uh, 65, 70 years old. They don't know anything about China, and you send them monitoring Chinese factories. That's not even their heart may be in the right place. That's not going to be the greatest monitoring, you know, operation. You want to have some gung ho, uh, 25 year old or 
I suppose it could be an older person too, but who's real gung ho about this, who knows something and who wants to uncover things and is not looking for a free uh, sort of holiday in Ch- in China visiting visiting factories. So, so those are more more the 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 kinds of of, of issues. And I think mostly continual pressure on the these these organizations, the organizations that give out the uh, uh, labels and. You almost need an organization to label the labelers. I mean, decide this is really a good, tough label. They they really trying hard. Again, they'll be they'll, they'll you'll find their label will be on something bad. That that's going to ha- always happen. Uh, as opposed to this one, where they're not really doing very much to to late to late. You know, they're it's more pro forma. So. We hear about a lot in the media about there's a lot of focus on China, what's happening in China and um, the labor standards there. And I believe in your talk yesterday, you said that China had just recently, just this month, passed some new labor standards. Can you tell us about that? And also tell us about I was I shouldn't have been surprised. I was surprised at the time to hear that the um, U.S. Chamber of Commerce tried to play a hand in this, didn't they? Yes. Well, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in China. I mean, yeah, okay. we have a, cha- is a Chamber of Commerce of U.S. Uh, firms in China. Yeah. Well, the actually the law was was actually enacted on June June 29th of last year. Took effect January 1 of this year. There was a new labor law uh, f- for China, which gave workers a whole set of rights and was meant to strengthen collective bargaining and the official trade unions, not not free trade unions, but the official ones, and the U- U.S. Chamber of, of Commerce in China uh, lobbied uh, against the the law being very strong. Um, there was a Chinese uh, one of the professors who was deeply involved in setting up the law came to the U.S. and and spoke uh, at various universities and spoke to Congress people and spoke to the FLCO to lobby the other side to sort of balance out the the, the multinationals. The law was finally uh, enacted, did indeed take account of some of the concerns of the uh, U.S. corporations. Originally, the U.S. corporations were joined by the European corporations. And then uh, the European corporations uh, got, I think, a big talking to by their trade unions and people in their own countries that the parts of the law, some of the parts of the law that the U.S. objected to were just normal European law. And uh, the European labor law being much more protective of workers than American labor law. And were the European companies opposed to the own laws under which they operated inside their own countries? And if so, about that. The European Chamber of Commerce in China eventually dropped out of the protest. But the American guys st- stood their grounds. And I think they, they gained some things, um, some weakening that they felt, you know, they wanted. Um and now we do have a law, but it, it still is a, be, a, a much stronger law than China has had. And hopefully the American companies, by having had their cons- some of their concerns addressed by the Chinese you know, authorities, will now work uh, fully to make the law successful. Whereas, you know, in the other case, they, they, if they felt the law was against, really against their interests, they might have uh, dragged their feet in, in carrying it forth. So in these kind of cases, I, you don't know in the end uh, whether maybe it was better to weaken it because then the companies now have no reason to uh, not, not to implement because it's, it's basically a law more or less that they had accepted rather than one they were protesting and dragging their feet about. Um, we have no idea whether the, this law will be implemented uh, strongly in China. Uh, it's totally uncertain. The Chinese government wants it to be implemented, but they don't want the unions to become in- independent or free. <laughs> um, and we'll see. Uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, to, to, to watch what happens. So is your impression that the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce in China was afraid that it would of just the impacts it would have on the facilities there or there would be a backlash that some of this might eventually come back to impact U.S. labor here? No, I think they were strictly worried about what was going to happen inside China. I think uh, that they uh, have a sufficient ability to veto effectively labor 
things in this country. That may change if a new administration comes comes in. There will be some changes, presumably, in labor law more favorable uh, to, to workers. Um, so I think it was just 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 China. They didn't want it. They, they're making a lot. They're, they're doing well in China, and you know businesses often are just worried about any change, mm. even changes that you know if you sort of took them aside and said, "Well, come on, shouldn't a Chinese worker?" One of the provisions was they should have a written contract. Why? What, what does that trouble you that they have a written contract so they can go to court and get it enforced? Um, well, the American companies might say, might have said, "Well, we have a written contract." It's just our, our subcontractors, and you know somehow or other that's going to mess up our subcontracting relations, or who knows, uh, you know the, the, those things. I'm sure they will do well under the new law, and that, that if even if the law had passed that they were stronger than they wanted, they're still smart enough business folk that they still would have produced profitably and and and, and done well. Only a couple of minutes left. I was surprised to hear you. Um said in response to someone's question yesterday that, uh, and we hear this a lot in the media, that nations like China are stealing our manufacturing jobs. And you countered that. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah. Um, actually, employment in, in manufacturing in China is going down, not up. Uh, what's happening is China is bringing in all the modern technology, some of it through our multinationals, some of it through the Japanese and the Korean and the European multinationals. And the productivity increases in China are massive, um, so that, in fact, they're losing jobs, all, not quite as rapidly as we are, but they're also losing jobs in, in, manuf in manufacturing. Our loss of manufacturing jobs as a share of our total workforce, so it's a proportion of our workforce, is going down at about the same rate as most other countries in the world. And what's happening is manufacturing productivity is so is risen so greatly that we can produce a lot of things and we don't need the amount of workers we needed years ago. And that would continue in our country, maybe a little slower, but it would continue if China disappeared tomorrow. Um, it, it, it's, it's just, it's one level manufacturing is going down the path we went in, in agriculture. You know, 1800 and whatever it is, 1850 or so, the most guys in the country were doing agriculture. Agriculture got incredibly productive, and now we, we, we need, what, 2 or 3% of the people in the country in agriculture, and they can produce food for not only us, but for the large part of the world, if, if, uh, et cetera. And manufacturing is going down that same, that same pace, it's, you know, and it's just going to happen regardless of trade. All right. Well, unfortunately, with that, we are out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in this morning.